Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. The words you heard at the start are the actual dramatic report from Apollo 13 to Mission Control alerting them to the life-threatening explosion that occurred on April the 13th, 1970. I'm speaking with Fred Hayes, who was one of the three astronauts on the ill-fated moon mission when a design fault caused an oxygen tank to explode mid-mission, putting the Apollo 13 crew in mortal danger. This was the seventh crewed mission in the Apollo space program and the third that was meant to land on the moon. Now, as you can imagine, I'm genuinely excited to be speaking with one of the Apollo astronauts. Fred and I talk about his life and his almost accidental entry into flying. We cover his admission into the astronaut program, the family impact, and as you can imagine, we go into some detail about his experiences on the Apollo 13 mission. Many of you will know of this mission via the film Apollo 13 starring Tom Hanks and Fred shares his views on the film and corrects some of the inaccuracies. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hello there, my name's Andrew and I live in North London. I make a small contribution every month to Cold War Conversations because the stories are so good, they make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And that's good enough for me. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm immensely delighted to welcome Fred Hayes Jr. to our Cold War Conversation. Your career is a, is a long one, but I was surprised to discover that your earliest job was being a journalist. I got interested uh, in that direction from being the sports editor on the uh, high school uh, Biloxi High Tide uh, newspaper. And during summers, even in high school, I uh, did uh, the lesser stories, some smaller stories like peewee football games or junior high games. Uh, for the local uh, Gulf Coast, Biloxi, or Mississippi Gulf Coast newspaper during that same time frame. The bigger reporter, full-time reporter, covered mainly the high school games, so I got, I got the, smaller, uh, the smaller features to cover during that uh, period. And it planned to go on and did go on to college in the first two years, was essentially majoring in that direction to be a uh, major in journalism. So how on earth did you end up at NASA? Well, yeah, what happened was the Korean War was going on. And when I finished the uh, approach in the second year, end of uh, second year of college, I thought I would serve my country. And my father had always uh, recommended I get into a program that would lead to an officer's commission. And it turned out with two years of college at the age I was, the only program that fit was the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. And I'd never been in an airplane in my life. (laughs) So anyway, I joined, uh, sometimes at 18 years old, you don't think too far ahead. But I love flying. And that uh, I instantly had a 90 degree uh, turn in my thoughts about career path. That somehow it was going to be in aviation. Uh, Because you have to realize I'm talking about 1952. There was uh, no space program yet. So, but aviation was what I was thought that I was going to spend my life at. How many different aircraft types did you end up flying? Uh, I think it was, if you count the A, B, C, D model kind of things of airplanes, 81, 81 types uh, in all classifications, transports, uh, bombers, uh, fighters, uh, helicopters, gliders, yep. Fairly wide variety of types of aircraft as well. 
while we were off air, you, you mentioned that you, you started training around uh, nuclear weapon release. That was after I was uh, had gone through four years in the military and uh, had actually started to work as a NASA research pilot. And in my first NASA center I worked at was Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Re- uh, Lewis Research Center, which is now named Glenn after John Glenn. And I was recalled into a reserve unit, uh, Ohio Air National Guard unit, the 164th TAC Fighter Squadron. In fact, the whole, uh, the whole wing was called up, the three squadrons called up, as well as a number of other guard units around the country. During that uh, particular period with the uh, concern uh, where Russia had parked missiles in Cuba and uh, was looked at clearly as a threat uh, that the U.S. wanted to go against. And uh, so there was a major uh, recall of forces and everything's put on alert. Kind of a hazardous time for uh, something really bad to happen. Indeed. So how, how did you end up being selected for the astronaut program? I had uh, three and a half years at that center. I mentioned Lewis Research Center. Then I moved on to uh, the, the, really the primary aircraft flight test center at Edwards Air Force Base in California, which was known then as Flight Research Center. It's now named Armstrong after Neil Armstrong uh, Flight Research Center. And I uh, was engaged uh, three and a half years there in uh, testing aircraft and uh, would have stayed because I really enjoyed That was probably the most enjoyable flying time of my life. Uh, was that episode at uh, Flight Research Center. I was flying a lot of different aircraft, involved in two or three uh, research programs, as, either as a primary pilot or support pilot, or uh, one, of, one of what we used was evaluation pilots, and a lot of support missions for the X-15 rocket ship program that was going on at the time. And uh, I had to think real hard, but I, I looked at where I was in the hierarchy of seniority, within the pilot's office, and I knew I would likely never get to fly the X-15 before it was finished. So I might get to fly some of the lifting bodies. These these were vehicles without wings that we were fixing to get into testing. Uh, But the thought of uh, going to the moon uh, was uh, just something that I said, this this would really be a great adventure (laughs) that I shouldn't pass up, even though, I had no idea what my odds were that I would get to be selected for one of the missions. So that's why I applied to be an astronaut. Do you remember seeing or hearing Kennedy's speech about going for the moon? Uh, yes, I do. I, it was, of course, at Rice University. And uh, I, I obviously uh, was not in the, the arena, the People that had, uh, at the time, sort of dreamt up, i call it the uh, simplistic uh, plan for going to the moon. But I knew there was, uh, you know, they'd been very busy with Mercury and uh, Gemini programs. So I, I figured they didn't have much depth <laughs> in, uh, in their, their work at that point. That down now they were given this grand mission, which, of course, no one could uh, turn away from. And uh, so it seemed, uh, at least in terms of thinking the uh, timing, to be a pretty uh, pretty tall uh, mountain to climb. And uh, as it was, uh, the technology uh, barely supported uh, the attempt to do that, certainly as far as computing power, both on the ground and uh, what we had on board, which was like one-tenth of a kilobyte. Uh, so that's what we had on board, not megabyte, one-tenth of a kilobyte. Incredible. Uh, so uh, we didn't have a very big machine, hand-wired. And uh, I'm sorry, it's one-tenth of a megabyte. Sorry. Not, that's still not incredible. <laughs> one-tenth of a megabyte. And uh, so I, I knew it was going to be a tough uh, hurdle as it turned out to be. Did you ever meet Werner von Braun, the uh, the German scientist who was working for NASA? Uh, I only met him at, uh, I'll call it, a couple of meetings and a couple of social events. Uh, I, I mean, my assignment as a support crew, 
I was uh, given the appointment that kept me busy developed with the de- testing and development of the lunar module, the landing craft. Uh, the astronauts, probably Charlie Duke and uh, Stu Russo and Frank Borman, uh, uh, I think were primarily concerned with the uh, Saturn rocket. And so they, they likely spent a lot more time in uh, technical meetings with uh, Werner uh, during that time. And so I, I really didn't get to know the gentleman very well at all. With history, we're, we're aware of his Nazi past. Was that ever talked about at NASA or, or not? No, it never, it never occurred to me anyway. Uh, yeah, he was, as far as I was concerned, he was one of the, one of the team. And, uh, and and furnishing the big rockets uh, that were going to get us airborne. No, a Nazi thing. I, no, I never came up at least in uh, at the centers uh, that I know. It might, it might have been something in the Washington scene, but the politics side of it. But no, not in the not in the program itself. I was surprised to um, discover that at one point you were part of the Apollo Eleven crew. Uh, yes, I was the I was the backup crew on both Apollo eight and eleven. Uh, in fact, the backup crew on eight was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and myself. We were the backup on eight. And fortunately, I didn't get to cycle to eleven because Mike Collins, who had had a medical problem uh, and had seniority over me in the in the lineup, uh, got well, and so he moved back into his position on Apollo eleven. And I served another backup assignment with Jim Lovell and Ken Manningly. Can you remember how they delivered that news to you, that you weren't going to be part of 11? Bill Anders told me. At the time, Bill Anders was actually going to be in the backup crew, not Ken Manningly. And Bill, within a few months, decided he would leave the program. And that's when Ken Manningly moved into that position. Uh, no, Bill Anders informed me that, uh, that, that the, the backup crew would be Jim and myself and himself i mean you must have been disappointed because at that point was it obvious that 11 was going to be the the first attempt uh no no i was obviously disappointed but at the same time i had to recognize the facet of uh, mike's having been actually he was in the position to fly eight he was the prime crew and had the medical issue and got pulled off of that mission so i you know i recognize that he had the seniority and uh the right to move back in if he got well to a prime spot. So, no, uh, you you always wish you flew every mission. (laughs) I mean, uh, so uh, that wasn't wasn't any different than being the backup on eight or the backup on uh, 16 I did. Uh, So I I always wanted to go fly. Yeah, yeah. You must remember watching the the moon landing. Where were you when, when you saw the landing? There's pictures floating around about that. Charlie Duke was the Capcom and Mission Control. And right to his left was Jim Lovell. And right on the other side of Jim, I was. But that was pretty traditional. The backup crew at critical phases of the mission would normally be in Mission Control. Just, you know, they were trained to go fly the mission and knew uh, what was going on. Well, the procedures, the handbooks that were being used. And so it was kind of customary for the backup crew to be available uh, to help in any uh, discussions that went on if a problem arose as to, uh, you know, what steps and actions may be taken. As it turned out, uh, in spite of those alarms uh, that were triggered, uh, we had nothing to say, to say about those. It was primarily Draper, Draper Labs and the uh, Guido people in Mission Control that uh, worked those uh, uh, warnings uh, that came on that uh, la- last part of the landing that had to be uh, given, you know, they had been given a go to proceed. That last part of the landing, the the atmosphere there must have been quite tense because there was that danger of them running out of fuel because they had to go and land in a in a slightly different area than where they'd originally planned. Right, yeah, no, that that was the critical part. I, the alarms, I was I was praying they wouldn't, and in spite of anything, wouldn't have called an abort because Neil had not reported any control problems. So, as far as I was concerned, the limb was flying fine, 
it just it just had some lights coming on. Uh, so I was hoping they would not call in the board and they would just go ahead and land anyway. I mean, what what was the atmosphere like when the Eagle had landed? Well, there was, a, a, uh, you call it a sorts of celebration in the room uh, because we had made the made the goal that had been set out uh, by the president. Uh, so, but no, I mean, there wasn't any champagne or <laughs> anything like that. That those, those kind of parties were in the next few days after the, actually, after they got back and safely entered, uh, then there was some uh, more festivities uh, of what you call traditional celebration. Nixon had prepared a speech in case they hadn't returned. And there's obviously that, that moment of worry that, you know, they have to fire that one engine to get back off the moon. That's true of every mission. Yeah. Every, every mission that, that one engine had to fire. Yeah. So Apollo 8 and the, every one that was, that engine had to fire to get you out of lunar orbit. Yeah. We'll obviously get onto Apollo 13 in a moment, but at least you had a few more options there, I guess. Well, we had a full limb on Apollo 13, uh, but... Uh, if you landed, you, of course, had used up the limb, basically. And so you were wholly dependent on that one SPS engine to fire and uh, that fairly lengthy burn to get you out of lunar orbit and roughly in the direction to get back to an entry. How did you feel when uh, you discovered that you were going to be prime crew for 13? Well, I, I knew that with the completion of 11. The normal rotation was three crews. So there wasn't, there wasn't any question I'd be on 13. Well, I'm sorry. I would be on 14. That's what I was thinking. I'd be on 14 because there was a three crew rotation. I guess the surprise was that we ended up on 13 because Jim Lovell got a call when uh, headquarters, I think, had overridden uh, Deke's selection with uh, Al Shepard and Stu Russo and Ed Mitchell to fly 13. Uh, and the, the headquarters got into it, uh, realizing that Al Shepard had not flown in some time on any mission, and Stu Russo had never trained for a mission. So they uh, elected to uh, give them more training time, and that's that's why that, uh, and it's the only time that was done. But Deke called, uh, called in uh, my commander, Jim Lovell, and, and suggested, or requested actually, would he, would he, would he be willing to fly 13? And, of course, Jim, without any hesitation, said, yeah, we'll fly. The sooner you fly, the better. And we had, of course, trained through two previous missions. So it wasn't going to be as difficult, certainly, for us to get ready. How did your wife feel about you going into space and, and flying that mission? Well, I mean, obviously, I think all the wives had reserves, but not, not just because it was an astronaut or it was a lunar mission. At least those of us that were test pilots, uh, if I recall the year uh, I left Edwards that year, they had nine test pilots die at Edwards Air Force Base huh. uh, in various ways. So the business I had been in for seven and a half years before as a research pilot or a test pilot was fraught with the same uh, concerns. So it wasn't anything new. I mean, it doesn't matter if you uh, fall from... Uh, a half a million miles or fall from a hundred feet. Uh, the results the same. Uh, so you know, it's there's nothing magical about it happening at the moon versus uh, an aircraft over Edwards Air Force Base. You get you know you get a lot more press, uh, <laughs> a lot more publicity, but that's about the only difference. Let, let's have a look at Apollo thirteen, and you're sitting basically on top of this huge firework. I mean, do you think about what could go wrong, or do you just think it's going to be a good mission? Well, you don't. You 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 obviously think about things going wrong. That's spent most of your training is spent training to handle things that go wrong. Thousands of hours in a simulator we had, uh, the command module simulator. They could impart over five hundred failures in systems, what we consider credible failures. And the limb less, I think the lunar module probably had about 300. And they were deliberate exercises we did with uh, a group called SimSoup, uh, where we integrated with mission control 
we would be in the simulators that emulated the spacecraft. Uh, linked to mission control, so all the data was on their scopes, just as if we were in flight. And this team of specialists, uh, a dozen people for each of the simulations we ran, dreamt up failures to try to make us look bad, either us and our mission control and combination. So we went through thousands of hours of nothing. In fact, they only gave us a few runs without any problems. Uh, and a week's couple of weeks approaching the flight, so we could kind of feel what the t- real timeline would be like with nothing going wrong. So yeah, we we uh, obviously uh, you think a lot about that. Not just uh, then though, uh, we were involved in the uh, development and design. So you work a lot with reliability engineering through the whole design phase, uh, do, supporting what's called FEMAs, failure mean effects analysis that looks at every possible failure, a wire open, a wire short, a valve fail closed open. So that's part of the design protocol to to build a machine. And, and of course, that drives, if you don't like manifestations of the failure, to maybe add in redundancy or add in uh, more telemetry of some sort. So you're involved all the way through, through that, through the whole getting the vehicle uh, ready to be flown. Yeah, it's not, it's not, they don't, you know, just sit around and one day they say we're ready to fly. Uh, you, you've probably been at it with the involvement. I spent over a year at Grumman uh, during that time testing lunar modules. And uh, of course, I, in that testing, I learned a lot more than I needed to know to fly it. I literally knew in some cases what pin and what 48 pin connector did what function, uh, which you, you'd never need to know to fly. So we were very immersed in the uh, guts of the machinery we were going to fly. How long are you sitting there waiting for the Saturn V to take off? Once you're buckled in, how how long are you sitting there waiting for liftoff? I couldn't say exactly. It was several hours. Several hours. Wow. We, yeah, we, we went out uh, late. I, I served a role on uh, 8 and 11. On 8 and 11, I was the last one out of the cockpit, out of the capsule when the crew was strapped in. I did what was called a, cl- a part of the closeout crew, and I had gone in and did all the switch setup to get the capsule in the readiness condition for them to board. And I did that on the, for those two flights. So I was out there the night before, about midnight, to do all of that preparation uh, for the crew to arrive. But you laid there after you were inserted, like on 13, for a couple hours, uh, really the position I was in the lunar module pilot in the right couch, I had virtually nothing to do. Uh, the calls from the uh, launch director and what switches or things had to be changed were mostly done by uh, Jim Lovell or Jack, Jack Schweiger in the center couch. So I could, and unfortunately, I couldn't enjoy the view. <laughs> because the uh, escape tower was covering the windows. So I decided to said to lay there and uh, listen to what was going on. Uh, you could feel some motion. They did a test to gimbal the engines, that kind of thing. So you could hear, f- feel a little, uh, not so much noise, but motion in the vehicle from things going on that way. Can you describe what it feels like, the launch? How much is it moving around? You know, the vibration, is it a phenomenal level of vibration and noise that you've got going? Uh, the Saturn V, of course, was an all-liquid system. It had five engines that ignited, uh, produced, what, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. The rocket weighed a lot. It was over six million pounds. So you did not move away at what I'd call uh, with a lot of acceleration when, when the hold-down arms released the rocket. I've always told people I, I, I've been in fighter airplanes with an afterburner. And when you kick in the afterburner to start down the runway, you get a bigger kick in the pants than we did coming off the pad. I've heard of Suyov people fly, from Suyov. They have to really look at the clock starting to realize they lift it off. It's uh, so gentle. And uh, there is a little more uh, thrashing around, though, because the big engines – the four outer ones gimbal. They can swivel left and right and four and a half to steer the rocket. And with that much thrust, a uh, million and a half pounds each engine had, 
moving a very slight bit would give you a lot of lurching motion. Uh, amplified probably because we were in a capsule way up on the top uh, of the stack. So it's probably exaggerated in that in that respect. The most unusual motion was the left to right motion. You know, I, I felt obviously in an airplane with turbulence of all kinds, low altitude and high speed on a hot day, lots and lots of turbulence uh, and bouncing around, being bounced around in the cockpit. But the sideways motion was more than I'd ever felt in an airplane. That seemed unusual. The G levels, though, overall, even the max G you got was modest. I'll say modest compared to fighter airplanes. You know, it got to four and a half Gs with the max on first stage at burnout. And uh, fighters, even old vintage fighters I flew, uh, you could pull over seven Gs in air combat maneuvering. And modern fighters are pulling up to nine Gs now. So the launch that way, and I'm talking about all of us had been military, all of us had been either fighter pilots and or test pilots. So, you know, we'd all felt those sorts of, uh, yeah, I, I assume it's a much more profound ride for someone who's only flown an airliner that flies as a mission specialist, say, on shuttle. Uh, it'd be, be a lot more for, profound for them uh, than it was for us on the Saturn. So when, when did it sort of smooth? Was it once it had taken off? After the uh, end of the first stage. When the first stage shut down, and that was pretty abrupt. Uh, if you hadn't been strapped in tight, you'd have probably thrown you into the instrument panel. But that was a very sudden, went from four and a half Gs to nothing. Uh, once the second stage started up, all, again, all liquid system, five engines, 200,000 pounds each. Uh, it was a pretty smooth ride. Uh, now, we had a uh, happening in our second stage where the center engine suffering POGO, uh, uh, fluid instability in the feed system, was automatically shut down two minutes early. Fortunately, uh, things would have started coming apart if it hadn't. Have. And so we had that little uh, burble of vibration uh, for a short time, a few seconds during that period with the POGO effect. Uh, but uh, that, other than that, it was a pretty smooth ride. And the second stage from all other respects, and same on the third stage, which had only a single one of those J-2 engines, a 200,000-pound single engine that took us out of Earth orbit to head to the moon. How different was the the first moments in space versus the um, simulations you'd done on the um, the zero-gravity flights? Uh, there's not no comparison, obviously, the... Uh, the airplane at zero G gave, gave us you know twenty five seconds of free floating, uh, whereas once you're in space, you know you're uh, completely free to float around and float objects and that kind of thing. It's kind of euphoric. Uh, I found it, although I was I didn't follow an, instructions people gave me, and I moved around too fast too soon to get ahead of my timeline on task I had to do. Had more time to look out the window. And I ended up getting a slight case of uh, space sickness, uh, a little spit up, uh, not not a huge throw up, but a little spit up. That not, and then the nice thing about space sickness is if you quit moving a little bit, it goes away. And thereafter, I moved very slowly, particularly when I was rotating, and I never had it reoccur. Uh, so anyway, that was uh, the, the, bad, the only bad side effect I had of zero gravity, but it was euphoric to be able to float around. Made the cabins seem a little bigger because you could use the whole volume uh, of the, the small vehicles. Of course, the biggest uh, thing, so I won't say shocking, but uh, stuck in my mind was when the first time we turned around and got a look at the Earth to see it visibly shrinking. Uh, as well, because we're still moving away pretty fast after we left Earth orbit. And you could visibly see the Earth now a ball growing smaller. And that was uh, the other difference in space flight for me from all my airplane flying, even though I'd done zoom flights in a 104 up to just under 90,000 feet. But it's nothing like uh, being out at uh, 20,000 miles looking back at the Earth. 
So uh, that that was the other most unusual thing about uh, being in space, that and zero gravity. And did you take any personal items with you or were you allowed to take any personal items with you? Yes. Yeah, we were each allowed uh, a limited number and limited weight and limited volume of items to put into what was called a PPK, personal preference kit. That was kind of a sad thing of our crew changeout uh, late, where Jack Swigert replaced Ken Magley two and a half days before launch. I probably spent phone calls, just phone calls, calling people, friends and family, asking them that I could fly something. What would they like me to fly for them? And I told them it had to be small and lightweight. So it took a little effort that way to, to figure out what I wanted in the, to have in the PPK. And of course, poor Jack. Uh, getting selected now to fly in Ken's as Ken's replacement didn't have time to do that, so he didn't get really to carry what he'd consider his PPK. But it was uh, small things: a ring. I carried a ring for a friend uh, that was a mason. I carried a crucifix off a of rosary beads. An aunt wanted me to; she wanted me to carry the rosary beads, but that was too much, too big. So I took the crucifix off and flew it. Those, those sorts of things. I flew some of my Marine insignia, uh, my, my initial second lieutenant bars, that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, but it was uh, literally small stuff and a very small volume packet that was uh, vacuum sealed. You know, we, we probably can't talk without talking about the, the movie. And, uh, and I mean, it features on there that you're playing music on a cassette player. Did that happen or, or yeah, not? Yeah, Did you take a, music with you? We had a cassette you? player. Uh, I did, had nothing to do with the music that was chosen. I frankly can't tell you if the song they chose to play in the movie was the song we had on it or not. Uh, I think Jim mostly, uh, uh, with practically some people had just recommended things that might be on it. Uh, you know, you're busy training. You don't spend a lot of time with that and so stuff. Yeah, so he probably p- p- did most of the picking of what was on the cassette. But it was a standard Sony, you might, you, same kind you go buy in the store uh, that had been pre-recorded on the cassette that was in it. Uh, we played it some uh, more for, I want to call it a little entertainment for a while, uh, but then it, uh, after we got busy and it got so cold, I don't think, I don't remember playing it much at, later on in the mission. You're slightly focused on, on other things, I guess, which, which sort of brings us neatly to where were you when the um, oxygen tank exploded? Okay. I was uh, in the lunar module putting away uh, equipment that we had taken out of storage to use in a show-and-tell TV show, live TV show that we just finished. In fact, if the explosion had, if the explosion had happened, uh, say, 15, 20 minutes earlier, it would have happened during the live TV show. Wow. Because we just signed off, literally. Of course, networks weren't carrying it. Uh, Mission Control was enjoying it. And I was still putting away equipment. Like I said, we did the show and tell. We picked things that we knew had not been ever talked about before and some new things we were flying that had not been flown previous flights, that kind of thing. Uh, Jim had already was starting up to return to the uh, command module through the tunnel uh, was when this happened. So he was sort of drifting his way back up upstairs to where Jack was all alone. And Jack made the first call. Uh, Houston would have had a problem here. Uh, when Jim arrived in the capsule and got his headset on and uh, did not return the call, he repeated it. So Houston got two calls. And what I think had happened uh, was the, panel when it blew off had hit the high gain antenna that was our primary communication route to mission control at the time for the tv show to have high gain and it knocked it off uh, it's a little bit out of alignment and so briefly there was no communication i guess that's why mission control hadn't answered jack but they, we'd gotten it back with the omni antennas when jim made his call the small little horn antennas I drifted up through the tunnel then to uh, head back up to 
join the action, if you will, that was going on in the uh, command module. Here's the first three minutes of the crew initially reporting the explosion and what their instrumentation is showing. You'll hear the voices of Apollo 13's mission commander Jim Lovell, Jack Swagger, the command module pilot, and Fred's voice too. Okay, right, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main beam on the bolt. Roger, main beam under bolt. Okay, stand by, 13, we're looking at it. Okay, uh, right now, uh, Houston, the uh, voltage is uh, it's looking good. Uh, and we had a, a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. And as I recall, BB was the one that uh, had a amp spike on it uh, once before. Roger, Fred. And the interim here, uh, we're starting to uh, go ahead and button up the tunnel again. Roger. Yeah, that, that jolt uh, must have rocked uh, uh, the sensor uh, on, uh, see now, an O2 uh, quantity 2. It's uh, was oscillating uh, down around 20 to 60 percent. Now it's full scale high again. Roger. And uh, Houston, we had to restart on our computer. We have pink light and, uh, and the restart reset. Roger, restart, and a ping slide. Restart and a ping okay. reset. And, uh, and we're looking at our S service module RCS yes, uh, UM1. We have uh, B as Bubba Pool, and D as Bubba Pool, UM2, B as Bubba Pool, and uh, secondary propellant, so I have uh, A and uh, B Bubba Pool. T bag temperatures. Okay, AC2 is showing the bump and I'm trying to reconfigure on that, Jack. Roger. Yeah, we got a, uh, a main bump A undervolt now, too, Sean. Main A undervolt. It's reading about 25 and a half. Main B is reading zip right now. Stand by one, Jim. 13 Houston, we'd like you to attempt to reconnect fuel cell 1 to main A and fuel cell 3 to main B. Verify that quad delta is open. Okay, uh, Houston, I'm showing. Uh, I tried to reset and uh, fuel cell 1 and 3 are both showing uh, gray flags, but they're both showing zip on the flows. We copy. 13 Houston, we'd like you to open circuit fuel cell 1. Leave two and three as is. Okay, I'll get to work on that. Can I look to me you're looking out the uh, hatch that we are venting something? We are uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. It's a gas and How how soon did you realize the significance of what had happened? Uh, not what you'd call a true overall significance, but uh, what I what was very quickly I uh, figured out from looking at the panel uh, from several readings and in different instruments that we had lost oxygen tank two, uh, and for me that was just all at once a sick feeling in my stomach because I knew that meant an abort. Right then, within within a minute, I knew we had lost the landing. We, in fact, I knew we weren't, weren't even going to go in the lunar orbit because uh, the normal answer for that particular failure, that type of failure in a major system, where you only have one thing left, tank one in that case, uh, you're going to turn home as soon as possible. wasn't, cl wasn't clear on how you're going to turn home, but that, I mean that basically was the what was going to happen. So I knew uh, we lost a mission, at least a mission we had planned. So then we got into troubleshooting for almost an hour with the mission control as a as not too long a time, but it became evident. I think mission control realized that sooner than we had that better granularity on their readings, that tank uh, one was leaking, a very slow leak. And I guess that was what Jim was reported sighting and seeing out the window at some point, at one point uh, that something was streaming away. That was the leaking uh, 
of material out of uh, oxygen tank one. And so the troubleshooting went on, as I said, for almost an hour. When uh, basically they'd run out of ideas, we kept cycling valves and shutting off portions, even including fuel cells, reactant valves or whatever, thinking a leak may, may be through a fuel cell. Uh, but they finally figured out, look, checking all the avenues they could think of, that they could not stop the leak. And uh, so that's when Jim and I were asked to go to the lunar module and get it cranked up. I'd actually gone a little earlier to get started. And because, uh, you know, with the second oxygen tank gone, I knew it, the mothership would be shut down completely. As it couldn't, it couldn't, the fuel cells wouldn't operate without oxygen and hydrogen. And I knew we couldn't use up the small batteries uh, that were for entry. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't very big batteries, three of them, small 48 amp hour batteries. So I knew the command line would just be shut down. So I went to get started, and Jim joined me to get the LIM uh, lunar module powered up to sort of live off of, and by time, uh, things more things got figured out. And at, at that point, did you think that, okay, this is going to be tricky, but we're going to be able to get back by using the uh, lunar module as a lifeboat? Oh, I had, I had no, I had no idea. There were a lot of things to figure out. Uh, I had confidence, though, because I knew that, the brain trust we had on the ground and I knew I knew obviously as we worked through all these simulations I knew the the brain trust we had immediately and then I knew we had a bigger brain trust across the country see NASA doesn't build a spacecraft the spacecraft were built by some of those 400,000 people a number of the engineers at the contractors that really designed and developed manufactured and tested the vehicles and uh, with the sign-off, uh, deliver them to NASA to go fly. So all of that was available, <laughs> all those mines. And uh, that's the way the system was worked through problems on previous missions, too. I'd seen an action. Um, uh, mission Control didn't have a ready answer. They uh, went, went to the MER, the mission evaluation room, next door in the next building to Mission Control. They had communications to all that brain trust I mentioned. So they could direct, in fact, they had some of the contractor major players right there with them to uh, go back to the plants in California or New York or Hamstandard in Connecticut or you name it and uh, dig out what information they needed. So I knew uh, that that was all in work uh, to figure out an alternate plan, if you will. Uh, I knew we had a chance of getting back and certainly in the right direction because we had the limb and we had an engine. I knew we, the decent engine. So I knew we could, I knew at least we could get on a path to come home. I wasn't concerned about that. But now how to live off this fort, this limb, which is a two day vehicle for four days, had some question marks. Uh, so so a, lot, a lot of those kind of things I knew were being worked. Uh, so I know I, I didn't, we never, never, ever got to a point where it was like you're falling off the edge of the cliff, so to speak. Uh, it's never a point where you say, well, it's all over. Uh, in any point in the whole mission. So you always felt there was there was hope that it was going to work out in the end. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mission, it was interesting. Mission Control felt that too. I went, when I went back uh, over 20 years, after I, after I retired from North of Grumman, I had some time. And uh, went back and dug out the inner room tapes in Mission Control for that time. The tapes that, that, that never leaves the room. It's within the system system people in a room and their support rooms and their discussions as they were powering down the command module. Realized uh, that there was no procedure to power down the command module. Just as there was no procedure to power back up. Those had to be invented. And they were ad-libbing as they were going through. I could hear their sort of professional, technical arguments about how to power it down because they were worried about damaging something in the system and doing so that they wouldn't be able to power it back up. So in their minds, they already had us back. We were going to enter. And they wanted their mothership to be able to be powered back up. So it was interesting to hear that years later. That was their feelings, too. They said, you know, we're going to get this thing. We'll figure out how to power it back up and get through the entry whenever they get back there. 
So that's the way those that, that part of the expert were always thinking at that time. I mean, amazing can-do attitude, I guess. It must have been quite crowded in the LEM then with the three of you if it was designed for two, because it wasn't that roomy for two people, was it? Well, there was a, there was a hole in the back, uh, in, the, in the F section of the LEM. Uh, there was a kind of a uh, cylindrical projection up into the cabin, and that was the upper end of the ascent rocket engine, the one that would lift you off the moon. And it made a natural perch perch for Jack Schweiger to sit on. <laughs> So, so Jack was right in the back behind us. We, Jim and I would be up in the front positions, standing, and uh, Jack would be perched in the middle, back back behind us there. So, you know, I wasn't really jammed up in that sense because that that area would normally be vacant anyway. And so, overall, you'd have to say the square footage available was less than the command module. Obviously, it had that lower whole lower equipment bay where the it was the food food service and the uh, potty was down there, that kind of thing. So you had that added area uh, down below the feet in the couch areas and the command modules. You didn't have that much open area in the limb. How much could your family hear as to what was going on at home? Because I, they had these boxes in the houses, didn't they? So they could listen to some of the communication. They could listen to all the air to ground. In other words, they could hear what the Capcom called up or t- passed up to us and vice versa, what we repeated or repeated back to the Capcom uh, mission control. They could not hear all these other loops I mentioned I went back into later. The inner, inner loops, I'll call it. Uh, you know, all, During the mission, there might be five or six loops of discussion going on, uh, all the various controllers and various disciplines. Uh, but no, they heard that, and I, I think they all of that though still had to the general public, and, I, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they were that and that guy too, say the reporters and whatever. It may have been it was a two or five second delay. I think NASA had a built-in delay before that transmission actually was heard. I don't know if that applied to the home or not. Can't imagine, you know, sort of listening to that and knowing the sort of um, crisis that you're facing up there. Well, actually, it should have been. Uh, it was funny. It was funny. Uh, some of the human aspects put into the movie of uh, my extreme throw up, a Jim Lovell hugging me, uh, Jack Schweiger and I's argument, that kind of stuff that didn't happen. I I kind of complained to Ron Howard that uh, after the first showing about that, and uh, he his answer was, NASA gave me all the air to ground that had been spoken by the Capcom and yourselves during the mission, and he said it never it never seemed to me you ever had a problem. So he said, I had to figure out some way to make you seem more human, humanize you. So he said, that's why I put some of that added drama in the movie. So I'm hoping our families felt the same way. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. And of course, they had a lot of support. All of, at each home, there were other astronauts. Uh, there were other uh, astronaut wives. They brought food, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. So they had actually one NASA protocol officer. That, that the movie at the end did injustice to that person. The NASA protocol officer did whatever the wife wanted done. If they, she, they wanted him to go get groceries, if they wanted him to answer the phone. I mean, that was his role. His role was complete support of the wife and the family. And uh, the, the movie kind of led you to, to lead that was a little different. That he was trying to force, I think, Marilyn Lovell to go talk to reporters or something. But uh, the, the the family had a lot of support, you know, from other astronauts that could explain what was going on and uh, that kind of thing. And I guess, as you said, you were used to working through problems through the simulations that you'd been doing. So it wasn't as though you were going to get into a state of panic ab- about this. You were just going to work it through with all the brains, as you say, you had on the ground. 
No, there's no question that they, uh, you know, the program like Apollo also attracted uh, many, many of the very brightest, dedicated kind of people. I mean, the challenge, the challenge drew people, uh, engineers, uh, management type people. Uh, the program had had the best of the best uh, around the country uh, because of that, just that intriguing uh, mission, uh, you know, drew that attention. Did you ever talk about if if you weren't going to be able to make it back and what you might have planned to have, I don't know whether NASA had planned that you would be able to speak to your families or, or what? No, I never, I never thought situation. about that facet of it. Uh, of course, if I had thought about it, I would hope it wouldn't uh, stop things just as I, I hoped and we hoped Apollo One Fire wouldn't cancel the program. I mean, uh, you uh, you have a goal, you want to achieve the goal, uh, whatever whatever it takes. One of the, well, there, there's many scenes in the movie, but the movie about where the um, the maneuvers to get you on the right trajectory back to uh, Earth. I mean, they, they only really, I think, feature one in the movie, but you were doing like two or three of those, I think. Is yes, that correct? We, yeah, we did four of them. Uh, we did the first one, which was a very critical one, that did get us on the path on a, call it a pseudo free return. Uh, that That's the one that put us a, around the moon at about 130 miles. And if nothing else was done, we would have splashed down near Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. But at least we're, you know, we're on our way back to Earth. And uh, the second maneuver was done after we passed the backside of the moon at the lowest point, uh, about two hours past that point. Uh, it was the longest maneuver we did. And th- those two maneuvers, incidentally, were done fully on the LIM computer, all automated, gym controlled the sop and start of the engine, and he worked the throttle on the decent engine. But basically the attitude control was done uh, through the computer on those two maneuvers. And what that second burn did was several things that put us, sort of cut 10 hours off our return, uh, which gave us margins on our consumables, uh, water and electric power primarily. And uh, as it turned out, then the lithium cartridge uh, carbon dioxide cure, and it put us back by our primary recovery force with the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier in the Pacific. And thirdly, to satisfy the AEC, it put the, the limb likely uh, break up in the pieces coming in in a deep part of the Pacific Ocean because that RTG with the nuclear core was still on board the limb. You know, the, the Thing that would have yeah. been the power source for the experiment we would have left on the moon had we landed. So the AEC was hoping it would end up in a deep, deep part of the ocean. And so that burn did all of those three things for us. We did two more mid-courses. They were very small burns, all manual, just looking out the, basically out looking out the window. Not looking out the window, but looking at an instrument that gave us yellow bars to hold steady very short maneuvers. One was 18 something seconds. The other one was like 21 and a little over seconds. So, uh, and that was exaggerated in the movie. It had the earth going up and down like we're about to go out of control. Uh, we didn't deviate more than a degree. There were no short burns. So, uh, but that was just kind of fine tuning the final trajectory to make sure we're in the, sort of the center of the entry corridor coming back in. You you mentioned, you know, going around the moon. What what was it like being so close, but passing over your landing area and seeing all the things that you've been training for? Well, it's a you know, brief looking down at from our area. And Jim, Jim, of course, I think was more down than I was uh, because this was his second time back to the moon. And he had seen all this before through several revolutions on Apollo 8. Uh, and now losing the landing, uh, Jack and I were busy shooting pictures. We got our cameras and we shot a lot of pictures. At 130 miles, we got to see a bigger expanse 
of the uh, that part of the moon than had been seen on any of the missions, which orbited at roughly at the 60 miles altitude. So we were double the altitude. And uh, I, I was impressed uh, about just how much more rugged the backside looked. You know, it, it, it apparently over the billions of years had not gotten as quite as big an impacts as the front side had, the side we look at all the time that gave you that big, those big dark areas. Those were huge meteorites apparently that hit to cause that uh, melting of the rock and those big uh, smooth, smooth looking areas, which if you get down to the fine look at them, I don't think they're probably smooth anywhere. They got small <laughs> craters because the moon's continually getting bombarded every day by something. And, uh, but backside didn't have many of those kind of features. Uh, we had Sierkowski, I shot a good picture of, which is a beautiful crater, dark with a mountain in the center. And the other one, which wasn't as beautiful looking, uh, the dark, the one as dark an area was Sea of Moscow. Those were the two more prominent features on the backside I spotted that I did get pictures of. They were, had Russian names because the Russians, of course, went around the moon the first time and shot pictures. So that gave them naming rights. <sighs> They were the first ones to get a lander on there, weren't they? Also, yes, right. Obviously, you're you're having to keep the power usage really low. So, what what are you eating during this period? I mean, you you can't heat anything, I'm presuming, food wise. No, when we lost the command module, we lost all hot all uh, hot food or hot water. So the limb had none of that. Now Jim and Jack tried to eat some of the what they call wet packs which was like Frankfurters in a pack. I think I saw one picture of Jack's with a spoon, spooning out out of one of these. What I assume it was like a thick beef stew, but it was probably at like 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so I, I elected to live off of the second area in the pantry, which had snacks. So for four days, I ate peanuts, bread cubes, and cookie cubes. So that was my uh, meals. For four days, I didn't. I didn't even bother with that other. And of course, the freeze dry, which was the bulk of the menus, was that dry powdered stuff. And that even even when you had the hot water in the command module and very carefully <clears throat> tried to mix it all in the bag, well before you tried to eat it, it was a little cold then. Cool, I should say, not cold. So I normally tape the bag to a floodlight with gray tape to heat it up a little more before I tried to eat it. So I wasn't too enamored with that powdered food anyway. Oh, you see, you're getting all the top astronaut tips on Cold War conversations. But, you know, food was not a problem. Water is the, always, for the human, is a critical element. So, and we had we had abundant drinking water. We didn't ever had a problem with that. You know, if you, right now I got a little, little uh, fat around my girth that I could probably handle 20 days without eating. Uh, it's still survive. you and me both you and me both yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah, but water you need uh, water in three days you'd be uh, probably a goner without water in the film it shows it getting cold how how cold was it in there well I, I can't tell you exactly in the limb lunar module because we did not have a temperature gauge an indication though was the water tanks in the command module froze the water tanks froze, and they were found still frozen when it was recovered on board the carrier hangar deck. When they retrieved the carrier on the carrier after the splashdown, they went in and examined the vehicle, and they found the water tank still frozen. Wow. So it was obviously uh, below uh, zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit uh, at some at point in the mission. In the limb, with our body's uh, warmth and with a few of the pumps we had running and some of the electronics we had on, I'd, I'd assume we were probably in the mid to, say, 35 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around in there. So we were, we had, we were not at freezing yet in the limb lunar module. And did you have any layers that you could put on to try and make you oh, yeah. warmer? Yeah, we had... Uh, extra underwear uh and we put on i put i had three sets of underwear on uh under my outer garment 
Uh, unfortunately, they were short sleeve. They weren't long sleeve underwear. I, I wish I'd had thermal underwear, but <laughs> there, there were three three sets of cotton underwear, and I had all that on. Yeah. Uh, people often ask, why didn't we put on our uh, spacesuits uh, with the lithium cartridge tying up one of the hose sets in the limb for that purpose of cleansing carbon dioxide? There was only one set of free hoses on the commander's side, and in that spacesuit, if you didn't have those cooling hoses hooked up, you would have perspired in the suit, even in that temperature. So Jim Lovell decided that rather than one of us maybe be reasonably comfortable in a spacesuit, we'd all suffer equally. <laughs> so none of us got in our spacesuits. Now, you briefly mentioned there the carbon dioxide filters. Now, one of the memorable sequences is where the crew are trying to make the converter so they can fit the round peg, fit the square hole using uh, bits of flight plan, cardboard, duct tape. Were you involved in that? No, I was not. I was I was actually, for, for the, first, several, uh, the first few days, well, the way we shifted was I was always on alone, and Jim and Jack then would be on. Now, see, after, it's hard to appreciate, but... See, Jack, until in flight, when he showed up in the lunar module, after powering down the command module, he had never been in a lunar module in his life. Wow. On the ground or anywhere. So he was you know, not very knowledgeable, obviously, about that spacecraft. So Jim and I, Jim decided we should shift that way and Jack would be on with him. And then I'd, I'd be off. So I'd be off duty. So it was on my off-duty time that they got the instructions to uh, put together that uh, cartridge thing, which incidentally, like most things, was thoroughly checked out on the ground. They actually had a chamber, uh, a vacuum chamber in Building 7 at Johnson Space Center that had a lunar, uh, lunar module environmental system in it for testing that system. And they... Uh, they, what they set up was a test where they impregnated that chamber with a very uh, extreme dose of carbon dioxide with that rig they rigged on the ground to make sure it would cleanse, that it would work. So that, that was kind of testing done on the ground before that procedure was ever passed up. And almost all the procedures were done that way. And simulators, astronauts would check out the procedure they invented and redline it if it was something was wrong in it and it go back to be reworked and so all those things were refined that way the simulators were run 24 hours a day uh during that time period so and some astronauts were available to go in and check out anything that needed to get checked out uh so that was again the kind of support and the system that was going on uh, on the ground during that time when the carbon dioxide problem reared its head, were you worried at all at that point? Oh no, no, I I just I figured out you know the the loose ends of the what had to get figured out was being worked, uh, and so I was really just awaiting the next uh, procedure and refinement and procedure. Uh, the biggest one uh, that we worried about the timeliness of it was the activation of the uh, mothership, the command module. As I told you, there was no procedure because command, the command module was never supposed to be shut down in flight. So none of our books had any procedure on how to power it up. And Jack copied that. That was a very lengthy uh, procedure with no blank paper. So he had to rip the backs off of a number of checklists that were blank to use to copy that procedure down very meticulously, number the pages so it'd have the, the flow straight. And we got that procedure passed up to uh, 17 hours before entry, before we we're going to hit the air. The first time we got to see that procedure of activating the capsule was 17 hours before entry. Jack and I did, the, did that power up. Jim stayed in the limb to control attitude, have communication, et cetera, if we had problems to talk about. 
And Jack and I went into that dead command module probably at three hours before entry because they weren't going to allow us to start the power up till two and a half hours before we hit the air going 25,000 miles an hour. So we went in there about three hours ahead and farting and it's dark, no lights, completely dead. Looked, looked with flashlights, looked around the instrument panel. First thing Jack got up, two towels so we could wipe off the instruments that were covered with water. And the first step in that procedure was for on each side of the spacecraft, Jack and I were to push in circuit breakers that had all been pulled out when Jack had shut it down. And Jack looked, thinking about all that water, said, let's uh, let's say, let me call out a countdown and let's go down the rows of circuit breakers and only push in six at a time and stop. And then we'll sit for a minute or so and see if we smell insulation burning (laughs) from a shark, electric shark. Yeah. So that's the way we went through the circuit breaker, getting them all in. And we fortunately never ran into uh, an electric short, which which was beneficial from the Apollo 1 fire that killed the crew because they had a very stringent set of wiring criteria and hermetically sealing connectors as part of that accident board's review that was imposed on all the spacecraft subsequently. So it basically made our wiring system waterproof. Uh, so anyway, we got through that. Jack activated the uh, fully activated machine, got a star alignment, and miraculously it had come to life. Uh, Jack was in the position to do the entry on the left couch, but used did an automatic entry using the computer that had been powered up. And uh, from the Apollo overall program report, I looked in one of the appendices, which covered the uh, entry performance. And we tied for the second most accurate splashdown of the program. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So, <laughs> it was because uh, we had obviously violated certainly the specifications that had been laid on the electronics in that vehicle and the com- command module. We're freezing it for four days. So we had violated specifications, but yet that thing came back to life. And gave us a second half or second most accurate splash down of the program. When you were not working through a problem, were there quite long periods of downtime where you weren't, there was nothing for you to do? Yes, there was. Long gaps. Uh, I talked a little bit with, uh, I would, when I was on that way alone, I'd talk with uh, Capcom occasionally, uh, with Jack. Jack uh, allows my, the, the, my most of them were in my group that I knew well and uh, looked at, enjoyed the view. It was amazing because we never really steady or steady. We kind of rolled around slowly. So I'd get alternate views of earth and moon as we continually sort of rolled around, not, not in the classic uh, P2, PTC or whatever it was called that would uh, bury the sunlight around the vehicle evenly. We never could set that up very well with the uh, just the lunar module, even when we had the computer up. So uh, it was kind of a random or cycling, but very slow. And so you had these alternate views to look at. And, and I got catnaps. Uh, I call not deep sleep, but catnaps uh, here and there. When it, because uh, sleep, sleep was sporadic. Uh, we never had a regular... Work day, sleep day, sleep night kind of thing uh, with the way that mission went. You know, because the, t- the times when they figured something out and when the next thing happened didn't necessarily fit a day night timeline. So you kind of got catnaps where you could. Before you go into re entry, I mean, that re entry is always a potentially dangerous time. Did you, did you say a few words to each other before going into re entry or, or was it just, here we go. No. Yeah, there's a lot of things crowded into that period. See, we had to, first of all, so, uh, separate the service module. I can't remember how far away from entry that was. And that's the first time we got to look at the damage. And then very late, we separated the limb because we were using the limb for communication and attitude control, as I said, all the time till we got the 
So we were still using the LEM at two and a half hours before entry. Uh, Jim was in the LEM while we were powering up the command module. So probably until Jack got the command module fully powered up and the, and the star alignment done, where the command module could do the dual attitude control, we were probably within uh, less than two hours, probably an hour and a half from, in, from hitting the air when we jettisoned the limb. And we did that by uh, overpressurizing the area in between and the tunnel area between the two vehicles. And Jack deliberately pointed us off to one side when we basically fired the pyrotechnics that cut the tunnel to give the limb a little kick. So we kicked, kicked it out sideways to make sure we didn't it didn't run into us on entry. That was shortly coming up. So that was done very late uh, to get rid of the limb. Were you concerned that there might have been heat shield damage or damage to the parachutes? I didn't think the parachutes would be a problem, but uh, the heat shield, but, you know, it's one of these things, well, so what? <laughs> what are you going to do, not enter? Uh, so the... Yeah, so it's one of these things you just, you just say, well, let's, let's hope it's not damaged too bad. And uh, you, you got to go through the entry. So, With Splashdown, how fast are you coming down? How fast do you hit the water? Uh, quite, quite soft compared to what we thought it might be because of Apollo 12. Uh, it must have been the wind state and the way they hit a wave or something. But they had a very hard splashdown on 12. In fact, it broke a camera bracket uh, holding a camera over Al Bean's head and actually hit his head. And he got a little slight laceration, a wound. When it fell down th- by his head and down into the floorboards, the bottom, uh, from their impact. Uh, no, And I was just sort of half expecting that may be the case. But I, I felt that, well, I wouldn't say it was soft, but it was uh, a lot smoother than I expected. What was it like breathing that air in when the when the hatch was open and you smell the, the sea air? What is that moment like? Well, the, the moment was really, a, the moment of, the moment of when you know you got it made, if you were talking about that, uh, most was when you see three shoots or two shoots, you need two of three. And you're looking up out the window at uh, see those big shoots uh, reef and then open up wide. That's when, the, that's the time you know you really got it made. It's kind of like that single engine out of lunar orbit. It's the same thing. And, and so that engine fires to get you out of lunar orbit, you don't know you're coming home. And, and the second thing is they're not gonna know you're coming home safely so those three shoots are out. And so that's when you know, yep, but we've, we've made it. Uh, so the splashdown itself was kind of an ancillary uh, event to that. Uh, but it was nice to have the hatch open. Uh, it, we were still cold inside. A smoky air poured out of the capsule when that uh, hatch opened into that moist, warm air in the uh, South Pacific. Uh, so it was nice to get out and smell real air too you know the capsule your capsules have a particular odor when three humans live in that confined space for a number of days we did and it was nice to smell nice fresh air yeah i can imagine and you weren't well in the last part of the the mission so how are you feeling at this point i think you had a kidney infection uh it was actually a urinary tract low, low in the lower area and uh it was a pseudomonious type bug, which was, uh, we had teramycin, I think it was on board. I took some of that uh, before entry, but that's just kind of a general uh, antibiotic. So they had to actually figure out uh, with a sample they took what the specific bug was. And then it was a directed set of two shots a day I got for uh, almost two weeks to uh, take care of that uh, bug I had. But, you know, I had chills and fever. It's kind of like I describe it for people. It's kind of like uh, flu, having a case of flu, chills and fever alternating, and burning when you urinate uh, as a byproduct of uh, UTI. 
but not, nothing uh, again. That, again, movie kind of over dramatized it, like I was uh, on the deathbed. Uh, it wasn't. It, it wasn't quite that bad. I mean, I could function and do things that, you know, if you have a urinary tract infection, it wouldn't stop you from going to the grocery store or if you had one here on Earth. I mean, you you could do all your normal activity. Or you wouldn't feel like going to the gym and working out, but other than that. Uh, so, no, I was not incapacitated by any means uh, by it. It just felt lousy. And when when did you get the first chance to speak to your family? Uh, that was in Hawaii. Uh, we splashed down, as I said, the, the Iwo Jima carrier was there to pick us up. They flew us on a helicopter the next morning to uh, Hawaii, and not to Hawaii, to Samoan Islands. And it was a brief ceremonial uh, thing go- went on there. Then we were taken on board an Air Force C-141 transport. And that uh, transport aircraft flew us to Hawaii where President Nixon with uh, Air Force One had picked up our wives. Not Jack wasn't married, so he, not his wife, but Jim, uh, Jim's wife, Marilyn, and my wife, Mary, were picked up actually at Houston because Nixon went through there to give a medal to the Mission Control people, a presidential medal of freedom he gave to Mission Control people. And then he they boarded again with our wives and were brought to... Uh, Hawaii, uh, to meet us there. That must have been quite an emotional meeting, yeah? It was, yeah. That was uh, that was a spectacular occasion uh, to be back in civilization and uh, uh, have that kind of honor and tribute uh, from uh, the president and, of course, see our wives for the first time in, well, really about eight days, I guess. Well, probably 10 days from the time we got to the Cape and get ready to launch. So we're probably going 10 days or so from home at that point. How soon were they doing debriefings with you? Were they already doing that on Iwo Jima or not? Uh, we, we started them, though, as soon as we got back to Houston. And there's actually kind of a uh, a checklist uh, format uh, that's been set up from previous flights that uh, Deke, Deke joined you, Deke Slayton, and uh, you just sort of go step by step from the very prep, even before the mission, flying, before flying about all the preparations, you know, to pick out any things that might not have, might need to be improved. It's mainly looking at it from that aspect. And uh, just kind of went through that whole flight that way. And that was uh, several days of that. Then we met with uh, the engineers, uh, subsystem managers, and the people, and almost went through system by system how things had uh, acted, uh, if there were, what was unusual, uh, what malfunctions we had to deal with. You know, so we kind of a full debrief of the, the spacecrafts, uh, uh, how it had worked and, and its health through the mission. So, we, yeah, we did a pretty extensive set of briefings for, uh, I don't know, probably a week and a half uh, back at Houston, though. Now, uh, you know, we've touched on the film because that's most people's reference point for the Apollo 13 mission. But, I mean, we I think we've already covered some of the inaccuracies, but was it reasonably accurate, would you say, in its portrayal of the of the mission? Yeah, I think I think some things. Uh, well, if you just talk it from a media, the media look standpoint, they uh, they rented uh, time on a zero G airplane and they took the actors up and actually had some of the scenes shot with them floating uh, in, in a short period in zero G. Uh, they built very accurate mock-ups that were used in the uh, films of the spacecraft of the cockpits and the geometry of everything with the tunnel and whatever, all of that was very accurate, done. Uh, they did a, a good job, I thought, with the uh, visual aspects, even out the window, somewhat exaggerated motion. Uh, again, it was another thing in the motion of the vehicles, but they obviously carried very well the overall theme of Apollo 13, which was uh, the 
you know, the sense of people in trouble, which we were in a team uh, that worked uh, diligently to uh, work through various problems, some of which they portrayed well. They kind of hand chose the, the difficult things to that would show well on media to pick and did a good job of that to uh, show again the teamwork that went on to uh, solve those uh, issues and help get us back. But no, most of the graphics uh, type stuff as uh, Hollywood does well, and not just on this movie, but most movies have got all this computer aided graphics. It's pretty amazing these days. Yeah. Well, it it sounds like Ron Howard, the director, was almost disappointed by how efficiently you dealt with the problems, and there wasn't enough drama there. Right. Yeah. Well, it was in his the voices. He expected. Uh, some degree of, I guess, uh, concern or frightenedness or whatever to come across in the voices of, you know, that we aren't going to get back or whatever. None of that, obviously. We just were one by one tackling the the, the things and copying procedures up and uh, then uh, debriefing after we executed the maneuver of, uh, you know, how things went, that kind of stuff. Pretty routine. Just a routine mission, hey, Fred? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, and, and as far as the root aspects of what you do, same way in testing the vehicle and the plant, uh, we dealt with an, an incredible number of problems of early, with the early limbs. A lot, a lot of it was the procedures we wrote were incorrect, but there's no end of dealing with things not quite right for that whole year. Yeah, I spent... Uh, a day I spent days on tests where it'd be 23 hours straight or 27 hours straight on one of the radar tests I did. Uh, I'd, take a, I'd, I would, I'd take a nap on the floor if they had a halt to some anomaly show up who couldn't figure out why. You'd always call a halt, just like a crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you run into that in a spacecraft test, you stop. And now you do a lot of talking and surveying of what possibly went wrong and then you have to carefully develop a retest that's not going to mess up the crime scene that you never figure out what went wrong. You know, it's, it's a, that's the kind of the ritual that goes on at, um, in spacecraft testing. Same in aircraft testing, in fact, if you're building a new aircraft. It'd be the same thing. And one, one of the, the scenes that's probably one of the most dramatic in the film is the delay in you re-establishing radio contact after uh, re-entry. Was that correct or was that just added for extra drama? No, that was correct. Uh, it, it, it wasn't any trauma to us because I didn't even have any idea what time we were going to come out of blackout, frankly. Uh, now it, was, it was really a, uh, a heartache and a concern, big concern for people on the ground. Because you know they they knew from the plots of the trajectory and whatever, really to the second almost where we should have we should have been in contact, a radio contact. And when we didn't, uh, when able to contact us, uh, they many people just had a real sinking spell about we had burned up an entry, you know that the heat shield had failed or something. So no, we, uh, we I had no idea of that, frankly, till after afterwards that that uh, trauma had gone on very powerful scene fred your book is called never panic early an apollo 13 astronauts journey i love i love the title and you've sort of summed that up in our conversation if you read the book you'll find it's, it's mentioned again in several places in separate ways but it's something uh, all of us face in everyday life uh, you know, if you have an injury and a child, I don't know if you're married and have children, but if you have all of a sudden something happens to your child, there's a, there's a, a period there where you, you, you'll you do better if you just don't do anything for a few moments and to figure out what's, uh, what's really the situation and take then figure out the best course of action. That was expressed in the movie uh, when Gene Krantz, and the movie told uh, the mission controllers to uh, to stop, get settled, and figure out things 
don't do anything wrong that can make things worse. Gene Kranz had that kind of a statement in the movie, and that's exactly yeah. that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's best to yeah. survey the situation and then figure out the best course of action, yeah. and now obviously promptly take that action. Yeah, I think one of my favorite lines from the film is when uh, the Kranz says, Let, "Let's figure out what is working here." Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the point I was talking about. And they was telling them, don't do anything, it'll make things worse. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos, and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters, and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road if you'd like to help the project just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate the cold war conversation continues in our facebook discussion group just search for cold war conversations in facebook thanks very much for listening and see you next week